Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, this talk uh, uh, is about the use of symmetries for design of network topologies. Uh, I am a very recent guy to the HPC field, different of the supercomputing Brazilian community. I'm just a starter. Uh, my participation in the field started because my master's uh, dissertation it was on applications of group theory for bio molecular biology. And uh, in 2010, my previous PhD advisor, Professor Hornos, and uh, uh, his collaborator, Professor Deng, invited me to participate in, uh, in their research on the applications of least symmetries for design of network topologies for supercomputing. And uh, we were designing those roots and weight lattices that are derived from the use of the least symmetries. And uh, uh, I started doing some analysis using graph theory. So that's what I'm going to talk to you today. So uh, the applications of uh, for supercomputing are, are requiring more and more computer power. Uh, for example, one of the uh, Two topics that are very dear for me as a physicist, uh, inertial confinement fusion and fission energy. Uh, I like to learn better and better how to generate power. Uh, climate research uh, and design and control of and manufacturing of new materials or even to projecting physical simulators, uh, understanding of the human brain, and uh, all of those things are going to require, of course, uh, the intelligence, human intelligence, but also uh, it's likely access scale computing and beyond. So uh, I was reading the report for the U.S. government on access scale computing, and uh, they were mentioning some challenges. At current technology, uh, the power consumption of an exercise scale machine would require one fusion power uh, facility. That would be a lot. So we would turn on Angra and <laughs> turn down, uh, turn off Rio de Janeiro because nobody would be able to light. And, uh, and uh, we would run the machine just to run the simulations for Petrobras, maybe. And then uh, we would need to learn how to deal with runtime errors and execution and communication. And uh, we also need to develop some uh, systematic approach for massive parallelism, as uh, it was being mentioned by Professor Panda uh, earlier. So the question would be how to adapt to the control of those communication uh, technologies at software level. And uh, another, another challenge that I learned from Brian when I was in China is, okay, uh, we would like to have a higher uh, use of the performance capability of a cluster. So we are now building petascale machines, but uh, the applications that are using petascale are still not so many. So how to increase it? I, came, I named it the how to increase the factor P of performance. And uh, at the hardware level, that is what I'm interested uh, I, I think I can give some contribution, is to increasing the uh, connectivity of the nodes, so that uh, we would reduce the idle time of the processors and get them working more and more, processing more time. In your, uh, one reasoning that I was developing uh, and uh, why I was thinking that increasing the interconnect could be better than just uh, than just packing more and more processors is that under the energetic power, uh, point of view, uh, the power consumption of one switcher is much smaller than the power consumption of an accelerator. So, uh, with one, if you increase the connectivity of the nodes, you can do this using a switch. And this is uh, under the, it's cheaper under the energet energetical point of view than adding a single, uh, you can get more nodes working 
here, then uh, only adding a, another accelerator to your computer. So uh, I think that uh, that strategy, it, it sounded okay for me. So the, the tool that I am suggesting that we could use, uh, one of the tools, to design more network topologies and get uh, an improved uh, interconnect or improve the communication is the, the symmetries. Uh, asymmetries in, uh, is a, usually it's associated with beauty, but for physics, physics beauty can be associated with conservation and uh, for some invariant quantities. So uh, the theory in mathematics that deals with the transformations that keep invariant some aspect of an object is named the group theory. It has large applications in physics, uh, for sure, in chemistry. I also worked with some applications in biology, in molecular biology, and I have been working with this, trying to apply now for HPC. Uh, the prototype is for the, the, symmetry, the group theory is the group of the rotations on, of a uh, rod on a plan. So uh, there is a two by two matrix. It has uh, four elements, uh, cosine of theta, minus sine of theta, cosine of theta, and uh, sine of theta, and cosine of theta. And you can generate rotations by an angle theta of a rod on a plan. Uh, also, this framework involves uh, more, uh, more tools, like the group theory of the, the Lie groups, the Lie algebras, and representation theory that is going to be used by us. So, uh, the main, uh, the, to start, let's define a Lie algebra. Uh, we are going to define the Lie algebra as, uh, we, we start with a vector space composed by operators. Those operators could be matrices. And uh, those matrices are, have uh, the entries of the matrices are real numbers or complex numbers. And these matrices, you can define a product between the matrices. And this product, once you have the product between two matrices of your vector space, you get another element of your vector space. Uh, if you get the product between the same element, it must be zero. And there is this identity that is named the Jacob identity that if you take three different elements and you change their positions in the product and sum up, it's going to be zero. So you can put them in a basis named the Cartan basis in the honor of Cartan, the French mathematician from the beginning of the 20th century. And you will get, uh, for a given Lie algebra, you can always write it in this form. The physicists are used with this form using the upper and lower operators in quantum mechanics for spins. Or, and here is just a generalization of that formulation. So you, may get, you can decompose your, your algebra in two types of operators. One type of operators are the center of the algebra, or the rank of the algebra, and the other uh, elements of the algebra are those operators E alpha and E minus alpha. E alpha and E minus, E plus alpha and E minus alpha are the upper operators, and uh, the E plus uh, minus alpha are lower operators. So uh, we can represent those operators Geometrically, here is the spin algebra from physics quantum mechanics. So you have the central operator. This is the Cartan operator. It's action on a vector of the space. Uh, it doesn't transform it. And uh, the action of the L plus operator is represented by this, this arrow and the L minus operator is represented by this error. So this operator acting on a vector has its uh, results in the vector itself, but those operators are connecting different uh, vectors of the space. This space has a name. 
is named weight space and it's formed by the weight vectors. The components of the weight vectors are the eigenvalue of the Cartan operators acting on, on a weight vector. So as we can note, uh, the weight vector is a vector space with uh, which dimension is equal to the number of Cartan operators for an algebra. And here is the example for the SU2. The SU2 has uh, one, only one dimension because it has only one uh, diagonal operator, the LZ or Cartan operator. And the connection between the different elements of the weight space is done by the L plus and L minus operators. We can use uh, those rules to develop, uh, to start designing some networks that could be used for uh, arranging uh, no the nodes in a cluster. So let's, uh, for example, the SP4, Lie algebra, it has uh, its vectorial operators are represented in this diagram. There are two operators here, the Cartan operators, and there are eight extra uh, operators, matrices, that are connecting the vectors in the weight space. There are connections that I will name them just orthogonal. Uh, they are on this x and y axis and the uh, diagonal connections that are represented here. If we put here over the weight vectors diagram uh, this interconnection, we could get the following uh, one network topology. I will name it a symplectic network topology. So it is very similar to the mesh topology. Those nodes are, uh, have coordinates given by integer numbers. So this bigger network is represented by, has ad, is addressed by integer numbers, and half integer numbers uh, are the addresses of those nodes on this minor network. Uh, the two networks are talking to each other by means of the diagonal uh, interconnections or the action of the diagonal operators here. So we can get two, two, uh, two mesh topologies combined into a single one by those uh, diagonal operators. In a very systematic way, you can always get, for any two integers that you give, you can always generate a diagram like that and then you can design your network topology automatically. So another advantage is that uh, the least symmetries were all classified by Cartan and Killing. Uh, it was a terrific work in the beginning of the 19th century. They classified all the symmetries. So think about the symmetry and uh, you can imagine anything, put your imagination to work as hard as you can and you still get a symmetry that can be described by this set of uh, these symmetries. So uh, this is a symmetry that has only orthogonal uh, connections, as this one. This is the SU2. This is uh, SU2 combined three times. But here we have some interconnects that are slightly different and may give you some different arrangements for your for the uh, communication with your nodes, and then you can get something interesting. Uh, the symplectic network topology in a bidimensional space is represented here, but it can also be represented in a three-dimensional space and we are going to uh, explore it a little bit better. The honeycomb mesh topology that is also uh, now is represented using this SU3. SU3 is a very interesting group for physicists because it relates to the classification of all, all the nuclear particles. So all the building blocks, building blocks, blocks for the matter are the symbolic surprise of this in this symmetry. And we have also the one of ones. So, so uh, 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 this gives us uh, some advantage. For example, if you think about the Bob Jimmy, it has a, a, a group, it, it, it has a, 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 a
just uh, uh, somehow also the design approach to this black uh, design and design works for this design. I think it can also for appropriate design design. So another part we can also explore is the importance of synthesis. One part of synthesis is synthesis making that is a very important one. So uh, if you are uh, working with uh, wood, you take a uh, a piece of wood, and uh, if you have good skills, you can make something very beautiful with it, and uh, make a pillar and cut it correctly, so that instead of a rotation by an angle in a plan, your uh, uh, piece of wood would satisfy rotations, for example, of 60 degrees around an axis. So uh, the symmetry breaking here uh, can be represented in the SP4 algebra instead of having a geometrical representation as considering cutting off a cylinder, uh, we could consider cutting off the, the operators, the diagonal operators. So we go from an SP4 Lie algebra to the combination of SP2 plus SP2 Lie algebra. So we will have only orthogonal uh, communication. This has an interesting, uh, interesting property because now we will go, if we look at the weight, weight diagram, we can go from uh, two combined meshes, intercommunicating meshes, to two independent mesh topologies. So the internal, the half integer nodes are not communicating with the integer nodes anymore. So if, you wanna, if one wants to build a cluster, that switches dynamically its uh, topology. It could be done uh, using this kind of property. Uh, and uh, this would give an, a systematic approach. So you could trust that uh, once you break your symmetry, your cluster and the communication would still be fine. Uh, the only requirement is to define a good rule to give numbers to the nodes, but that is straightforward. Uh, another thing that uh, I was willing to do is to analyze uh, a bit the network topologies and compare uh, the simplect topology with some of the topologies that are always around. So the most common are the hypercubic, the mesh, and torus. So uh, I started analyzing them. Uh, I would start with an n-dimensional lattice uh, that would be for the simplect 2 times n algebra. And then uh, we would indicate the total number of nodes of a given lattice by nu. And the total num the maximum number of edges uh, from a node by epsilon. So the nodes will be uh, distributed in a lattice built on the integers. A lot the lattice will be, let's say, hyper square, mu. Uh, mu it will have mu nodes at every di direction, so it is on the n dimension. Mu could be an integer, and uh, the simplex, so the simplex will have also semi-integers. The diameter uh, or the maximum distance between two nodes of the the network will be indicated by L. So if we take the hypercube uh, at n dimensions, it will have two to the power of n uh, nodes. And each node will have two uh, times n edges coming out of, of it. And the maximum distance between two nodes is, going to, is given by the dimension of the network. The mesh is only we substitute mu, uh, two by mu. The number of edges coming out of each node will be uh, maximum equals to two times n. There are also the boundary nodes. Those ones have different connection properties. And the maximum distance between two nodes is given by the dimension times the number of nodes per dimension. The torus uh, is very similar to the mesh. You just have to connect the ending nodes to the, uh, together. So it is the blue gene arrangement. But it has an advantage that the maximum distance is reduced by half of the amount of nodes. And then uh, the simplectic 
2n. The simplex 2n it has a slightly different now. The number of nodes is not as simple as it is given here for these uh, classical arrangements. So that is going to give different numbers for the amount of nodes uh, in a network. But it has a big advantage. For the symplectic topology, each node is going to communicate to 2 times n to the power of 2. So it increases by a factor n, the, no the maximum number of edges or communicating, uh, nodes communicating to each other. So this is a good strategy to increase uh, the, um, the communication. But and the and the diameter will be comparable to the mesh topology. Of course, if we make a torus, we would reduce this maximum distance by half. But uh, that's that's straightforward. So just to have a picture in mind, here is uh, the the hierarchy in two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions. The mesh topology in two dimensions and three dimensions. And uh, the torus topology also in two dimensions and three dimensions. And as we have seen already, the symplectic topology. So the distance matrix that will be a, a map stating the distances, the typical distances between uh, any two nodes of inside the, the network, the node I and the node J. For the hypercube has this general form. One way to get this matrix is by a recursion relation. It could be done in a different way, but uh, this form is, uh, it, it is easy to represent. And uh, we define also a matrix E to N, that is a matrix uh, of 2 to the power N times 2 to the power N, where all entries are equal to 1. And uh, for n equals to 0, the delta is equal to 0. So if we get these two information, we can generate any distance matrix uh, for the hypercube. Um, similarly, we can get the same, uh, get a similar procedure for the mesh topology, uh, also get, getting everything by recursion. It could be done uh, also straight, uh, differently, but uh, again, I like this way to represent it. And uh, those matrices delta uh, index J are the summation between the, the delta matrix for the previous dimension plus J times the matrix E. Now generalize it. Instead of two, we, we include here mu. Uh, the torus also have a, can be the distance matrix for the torus at any dimension can be represented by recursion. Uh, the matrices A and B are matrices dependent on the distance matrix of the previous uh, dimension, and E here are defined as the previous slide. The, um, we can, and we can also define this distance matrix for the symplectic algebra. Those matrices A and B are a little bit, uh, they are similar to the matrices for the mesh topology. Uh, so, uh, I, I have included all the, uh, in order to analyze how would the symplectic topology be useful for designing network topologies, I have analyzed the typical dis distribution of the distances in, in the graph distance between the nodes in a network topology. I have considered network topologies with 500 to 700 nodes. Uh, the, the, the different topologies will not give necessarily the same number of nodes. So each topology will give you some number of nodes. So that is uh, depending on the amount of nodes you, can, you want to use. You can maybe choose between one or another uh, topology. The, so in red here, I have included the hypercubic topology at nine dimensions. So it will give 500, uh, 512 nodes. And in, in uh, blue, I have included the mesh topology at three dimensions. Uh, the number of nodes per dimension is eight. 
and uh, we see that the, the total number of nodes is 512, but this mesh topology uh, will cause the, for example, the average distance between two nodes to shift to the right, so it increases the, dis the average distance of communication between two nodes. Uh, in light green, I uh, have included the, the mesh in two dimensions. It moves for, even forward to the right. Uh, it is a mesh with 26 nodes per dimension, and it will have 676 nodes. So it has more nodes, but still it shifts the distribution of distances to the right. Uh, the SP4 is represented in brown color. It has, uh, it is a mesh uh, with 18 nodes per dimension. The, and the, as we see, it has 685 nodes. And it has a shift to the left in comparison with the mesh 2D. And if we take the SP6 uh, for, with five nodes per dimension, the, at the bigger network, it will have 666 nodes and we see that uh, the, the distance is going to be shifted to the, to the left. So this scheme, even uh, without the torus uh, uh, topology, it already is capable of reducing the distance between the nodes of the network, so it might be useful to uh, increase communication in a cluster. Well, I was expecting the conclusions here, so I will just say, uh, as conclusion, as a summary, um, so uh, the, the, the increasing of the performance factor in a cluster will, will require an increase on the communication capability of the cluster, that is necessary. The, in order to do that, one strategy would be increase the amount of edges of the nodes so that the node would communicate to more nodes. And uh, symmetry, uh, the least symmetries uh, provide a, a systematic and well worked uh, machinery, mathematical machinery for designing networks and getting a higher, uh, higher connectivity per node and giving uh, um, a precise recipe for designing and uh, addressing the nodes of the network. If we use uh, symmetry, the concept of symmetry breaking, we can even get dynamical adaptation of the network and change the topology online on the runtime. And uh, as we see, if we use, for example, the symplectic topology, we can get increased, uh, increased uh, interconnect per node and even uh, reduce the typical distance in a cluster. Uh, I would like to thank, um, so uh, I don't know if everyone is aware, but uh, we are uh, uh, here at the University of Sao Paulo, we have uh, this team named Apuama, and we are participating uh, in the student challenge competition that is happening in Germany. It will be, it will be next June. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the guys of our team, Professor Fabio Nakano, Henrique, and uh, Luis, Monique, AJ, uh, Carlos, Aguni, uh, Flavio and Gustavo Burin. So those are the, the guys, they are learning very deeply how to use uh, clusters in taking out the best performance possible. They are working hard. Uh, and this work was done in collaboration uh, while he was alive, Professor Orms. He passed away recently and uh, with Professor Yue Fandeng at Stony Brook University. Uh, thank you.